I will um, start this off uh, and I uh, wish all the ladies and gentlemen who have uh, uh, gathered today uh, a very good afternoon to those who are uh, in India and a very good evening to those in uh, Japan. As uh, I have seen a significant number of registrations from um, outside India, uh, especially Japan as well. So uh, welcome to IJSC at IMB. Uh, Tatsujin speak or expert speak uh, webinar lecture series. And uh, my name is uh, Saidi Pratnam. I am the chief operating officer at this center. And uh, IJSC is a center of excellence at uh, IIM Bangalore. And uh, the focus of this center is primarily to strengthen uh, India and Japan bonds by prom promoting all types of activities, uh, chiefly academic, industry, as well as cultural and societal uh, linkages uh, between these two uh, great companies, uh, countries. Um, uh, this uh, webinar series is one uh, of such an attempt to increase the bond wherein we are bringing in experts from both the countries to talk of uh, societal, technological, business, and uh, other facets of life, highlighting both the Indian and the uh, Japanese uh, uh, perspectives. In fact, uh, this uh, we started in the middle of the pandemic. So uh, that is how uh, the uh, seminar series has converted itself into a webinar series. And this is the fifth in this series. Uh, and we have uh, with us today a great uh, uh, business leader who is an uh, internationalist uh, at heart, but one who firmly believes that India uh, must build its own uh, capability in order to play uh, a significant role on the uh, global platform. He is an entrepreneur uh, with a vision to build a strong India, which would uh, uh, become the world's uh, factory in the uh, coming decades. Um, just, uh, sorry. Um, I have uh, a great uh, pleasure to welcome Baba Saheb Kalyani, known to all of us as uh, Baba Kalyani. And uh, being a doyen of uh, Indian manufacturing, there is uh, very little to tell you, tell about him that uh, our uh, audience, both Japanese and Indian, won't already uh, uh, know. But uh, I shall attempt here to briefly do so for two reasons. Uh, the first is that uh, his uh, CV is uh, uh, so inspirational that it's always good to uh, revisit that CV. And uh, it also uh, highlights some of his work uh, in the areas that are significant for today's discussion. And, uh, and the discussion today is on the technological innovation and uh, sustained economic uh, development. And uh, what can India and Japan learn from um, each other? Um, I have great pleasure to uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, Sri Kalyani, who is a chairman and uh, MD of uh, Bharat Forge uh, Limited, uh, which is, of course, uh, as all of you know, the second uh, largest forging manufacturer in the world. And uh, it has uh, joint ventures with uh, many uh, global MNCs, including uh, uh, Meritor in the US, uh, Maxicon Wheels in uh, South America, Elbit Systems and Rafael Advanced uh, Defense Systems in uh, Middle East, Israel, amongst uh, many others that they, he has. His uh, entrepreneurial drive uh, clubbed with his uh, um, uh, penchant for developing best-in-class technology has uh, placed uh, Bharat Forge 
as a, a category leader in uh, the global uh, automotive and uh, industrial landscape. And uh, it has facilities, manufacturing facilities spread across India, US, and of course, uh, a significant presence in Europe. It has led to a global presence uh, across uh, many sectors. Automotive is one, oil and gas, railways, marine, mining, aerospace, amongst uh, uh, other sectors. Um, and uh, considering his long association with uh, Japan, uh, Kalyani-san has uh, served, in fact, as the co-chairman of the India-Japan uh, Business Leaders Forum for uh, over eight years. He's a member of the board of directors of uh, Hitachi for uh, a couple of years in 16 to 18. And uh, he is one of the very few Indians uh, to be bestowed with the order of uh, Rising Sun, Gold and Silver Star, uh, which is an honor given by the government of Japan for his uh, great contributions to strengthening the economic relationship between uh, Japan and India. And that happened uh, uh, 2019. And of course, he has similarly been conferred uh, uh, very significantly. Indian government also uh, long back uh, in 2008, it has recognized uh, his contributions to trade and industry by uh, giving him the Padma Bhushan. Um, Mr. Kalyani, as all of you know, is a role model for all of us. Um, but for key things in the uh, industry area, economically sustainable growth, I think he has worked very hard on this. He has built on a very strong uh, connect uh, with one's roots uh, while exploring new avenues through uh, collaborations with international partners. He also has uh, uh, a very significant and imposing presence in various uh, international business forums, such as the India-Sweden uh, Business Roundtable, member of the Indo-French uh, CEOs forums, member of US-India CEOs forums. These are all uh, some of the many other uh, forums and uh, in which he, he is uh, actively uh, participating. For all this, he has earned uh, the name uh, Forge Master in uh, global conventions. And um, of course, academically also, he has been recognized by uh, various, uh, including um, a university, uh, Deakin University in Australia as a doctor of science. And uh, of course, IIT Kharagpur in India as well. Um, of course, the list goes on and on, but I would like to, uh, definitely talk about this one significant uh, um, initiative where he's a permanent member of the PM's uh, Science and Technology and Innovation uh, Council, Government of India. And he's also the founding president of the Society for uh, Indian Defense Manufacturers. So that where he's playing a very key role. And uh, again, as a chairman of the National Committee for Defense, he has actually championed uh, a very increased uh, participation of the private sector. And I think these efforts are finally uh, showing in results. And uh, we have uh, a very interesting uh, uh, policies changes, which, which is happening in the defense manufacturing side. Policy framework uh, changes, which has been, he has been driving in all these capacities. And uh, uh, what is interesting is that uh, he, his company, and his focus has been on sustainable growth through various initiatives such as uh, research, uh, uh, education, uh, skill building, skill development, women empowerment, and even sports and healthcare more recently. Um, Mr. Kalyani has been uh, zealously involved in uh, the research and development of uh, technologies which are economically sustainable and its adoption on uh, both national and on uh, global scale. So 
I uh, welcome you, sir, uh, to this uh, uh, forum. And uh, uh, but before that, I would like to also uh, set the context for the discussion for today. And the theme today is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, technological innovation and uh, sustainable economic uh, development. What can India and Japan uh, learn from uh, each other? Um, but uh, before uh, we get into a discussion, I just wanted to tell the participants, all of you, that uh, uh, at the end of this uh, discussion, uh, Kalyani San has agreed to answer your questions. And uh, so do uh, uh, please uh, key in your uh, queries, um, anything which you want him to address, any issues, and uh, he will be uh, provided, of course, uh, the time availability, he will be very pleased to uh, answer them. Um, primarily, uh, the title suggests that there are three uh, sub themes uh, for today's uh, discussion. The first is, uh, of course, innovation. Second is uh, our uh, two countries relationship, India and Japan's uh, relationship. And third is sustainable uh, growth, economic growth for uh, India, as well as, of course, for uh, Japan. And uh, you, sir, Kalyani, sir, you are a master of, on all these topics. <laughs> and uh, you have demonstrated this time and again through your passion and uh, through your uh, actions, which, of course, speak for themselves, and your leadership, both at uh, national and uh, the global stages. So uh, the first uh, sub theme, of course, would be innovation, as I have said. And uh, Kalyani, sir, you have spoken before about uh, how uh, crisis seems to uh, trigger innovation across the world. And um, the old uh, saying, uh, you know, mother is, uh, mother of invention is uh, some sort of troubles. So. And we have seen this happen in the uh, 30s where depression uh, hit uh, the economies of the world. And uh, as you had uh, mentioned in many of the forums, that technological innovations actually kick-started in, in, uh, typically around uh, in, in the 30s, uh, starting with the jet engines, uh, as you had mentioned many times. And uh, the world war of the 40s uh, triggered another great, uh, and which also uh, you uh, mentioned about in your uh, various uh, talks about what happened to the America's uh, uh, defense uh, uh, muscle building. And uh, you quoted uh, that Freedom Forge, um, uh, Fre Freedom's Forge, which is uh, a, a great book on, on this topic. And uh, in the early 70s, uh, then we had the oil shock, where uh, Japan's uh, uh, manufacturing or lean manufacturing uh, took off in a, in, a, in a sort of significant uh, way. So, uh, uh, Kalyani, sir, we would like to, uh, I would like to frame the first uh, uh, question for our discussion to begin. Uh, we would like to hear from you, uh, the audience uh, as well, and uh, we here. Uh, what are your thoughts and uh, on how uh, a crisis itself seems to trigger uh, innovation? And uh, if you could also link uh, and the story that you talked about, the Freedom's Forge and other such uh, uh, crisis uh, which has happened over the years, decades. Uh, if you could uh, connect it also with uh, the current crisis that... Uh, India is going through, the world is going through, Corona, uh, which is a global phenomena, border tensions, which is, uh, uh, it's also a global phenomena, but currently our northern borders are very uh, hot. Economic downturn, um, prob partly linked with Corona, but even it started even much before that, where uh, both India and the world uh, is uh, struggling. So, sir, uh, may I ask uh, you to respond uh, to uh, this question, whether how 
crisis seems to uh, historically trigger uh, innovation. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Ragnam, for your very kind introduction. And of course, for framing the context of uh, uh, the discussion that we are going to have today. Yes. Uh, of course, I'm very happy to, to respond to this. Uh, uh, you know, converting a crisis to innovation sometimes is, uh, uh, is an issue that's uh, forced by an organization, forced by a nation. Sometimes it happens because of the crisis itself. So there are various examples from history, right from the first pandemic that we know, I mean, not the first pandemic, but let's say the last pandemic that happened in 1918, the Spanish flu, and how uh, it you know, created a different kind of uh, reaction and uh, action in terms of science and technology that uh, preceded uh, the pandemic, uh, that uh, came after the pandemic in the world. Of course, the biggest example is uh, what happened during World War II uh, between 1939 and 1944. Uh, and this is very well charted out in this book that you mentioned, Freedom Forge, written by uh, a professor called Arthur Hellman. And, uh, you know, it's an example of how uh, the private sector in the United States how individuals uh, who were very nationalistic minded, uh, who believed that uh, they need to do this for their country, uh, came together at, at the call of President uh, Roosevelt, left their jobs. Uh, uh, one was the president of General Motors, uh, Bill Knetson. Another one was a big shipping magnet uh, in California, uh, Henry Kaiser. And there were many others who came, who left their five-figure salary jobs, came to Washington, worked on a $1 per year salary, and created what we know today as uh, the military uh, uh, machine of the United States. And, uh, you know, if you have to just look at the numbers, they produced uh, in four years, four and a half years, 324,000 fighter aircrafts, okay? We have a hard time making seven per year, right? Now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so 340, of course, there were different kinds of aircrafts, yes. but they still had engines and they were flying and, you know, they were going all over the place. Uh, and, you know, similarly, they made uh, something like 140 aircraft carriers. Uh, they made 200 submarines, all this in a matter of four, four and a half years. And companies that were making cars and making refrigerators and making consumer products all joined hands together and converted their uh, factories into factories producing uh, military hardware. Of course, this was done at the request of uh, Great Britain and France, which was under the attack uh, 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 from Germany at that time. And they were running out of their own hardware and uh, uh, they came to Roosevelt for some help and they created this whole process. I think it's an interesting story and that's what created uh, America's industry as we see it today. I mean, this entire, you know, this four and a half years of experience of producing such a large amount of products. I mean, there's like uh, $185 billion worth of products produced uh, for military hardware is equivalent to about $2.8 trillion of products today. So it's equal to India's GDP, which was done uh, just making military products. And this is what propelled uh, technology uh, in the United States, uh, propelled manufacturing. And, you know, then uh, the 50s and the 60s and the 70s <coughs> were times when manufacturing really took off in the U.S., in, in a very, very big way. And a lot of technological, uh, 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 you can call it evolution or revolutions kind of began. And, you know, uh, the world was a much more prosperous time, had a much more prosperous time in those uh, 30, 35, 40 odd years. So that's a good, uh, a good example of, uh, you know, how a crisis was converted to an opportunity and how Innovation came. Innovation came in many, many forms. A lot of new technologies were built. 
a lot of new knowledge was uh, imparted. Uh, of course, it was uh, in those four and a half years, it was all military hardware, but after that, it got converted to uh, civilian products. It got converted to, you know, products that all of us use. And then, of course, a lot of electronics came in in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, Japan was very much uh, in the forefront of that technology at that time. And, you know, then we went through this industrial revolution, what we call as uh, the electronic revolution, which unfortunately India missed. That's the third industrial revolution. And now we are at the cusp of the fourth industrial revolution, which everybody calls us Industry 4.0. Japan calls it, uh, calls it as Society 5.0. Uh, there are various different names uh, for that, but it's basically a convergence of uh, IoT, uh, uh, AI, digital, and you know, how do you make people's lives smarter? How do you make people's lives better? How do you bring in efficiencies into everything that you do? So this is what we are uh, going through right now. And you know, the good thing is India is pretty much uh, in the middle of this uh, uh, revolution. So I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, coming to another uh, example of uh, how a crisis uh, becomes an opportunity is what happened during this pandemic last year. When the COVID-19 hit India in the uh, <coughs> early part of 2020, uh, uh, the Prime Minister declared uh, a lockdown from the 23rd of March for three months, as you know. It was a very severe lockdown. And uh, you know, all the factories were closed, schools were closed, everything was closed. We were at home. Uh, all of us worried about uh, the pandemic. But at that time, uh, we had in this country a lot of people getting into hospitals uh, uh, because of the COVID-19 infections and the hospitals were running out of beds. The hospital staff was running out of uh, the PPE equipment. Uh, we had no ventilators. Uh, we were getting ventilators, a uh, few hundred numbers from the US, something from here and there. And it's remarkable that <clears throat> in a matter of three months, India uh, not only was able to produce enough PPE uh, stuff for our own requirements, but we became the largest exporters of PPE equipment. Uh, we made so many ventilators that, uh, you know, the, the, there was no need for ventilators anymore. Uh, so this is, this is a good example of how uh, a, a opportunity, I mean, how a crisis became an opportunity. And now there are so many companies, and this was all done by the private sector, so many companies manufacturing so many medical equipments not necessarily only for COVID, but for other uses also. There's a whole host of new technologies and uh, processes that came into being. The Indian pharma industry jumped into the fray and then became a big supplier for uh, the medicine that we use for treating COVID at that time. The COVID protocol has gone on changing, as we know. And now India is the largest producer of vaccines for uh, COVID-19. So I think this is a fantastic story, how in less than 12 months from zero, uh, we are almost uh, beyond 100 as far as uh, this issue is concerned. And I was talking to somebody, a friend of mine, uh, a very senior CEO in Germany, just about an hour ago. And we were talking, he was asking, what is it that has made India uh, really you know, conquer this entire uh, COVID pandemic because our infection rates have come down compared to what they see in Germany or you know other parts of Europe. Uh, uh, we are pretty much under control and uh, we are monitoring and managing this extremely well. And I think one of the uh, one of the reasons why this is happening is at least in India, when we have uh, a crisis like the pandemic. With the leadership that we have, with the with Honorable Prime Minister, uh, uh, Mr. Modi today, uh, with his entire uh, cabinet, with his uh, uh, key bureaucrats, you know, all the silos uh, were broken down and we became, got into a mission mode. And I think when India goes into a mission mode, there's very little that India cannot achieve. And that's a good example of how uh, you know, it has actually taught us how to become Atmanirbhar in one way. 
that you know get into mission mode. And if you see the budget that was announced uh, uh, some weeks ago, uh, it's the first time in the budget you know things are being done in a mission mode. So whether it's the disinvestment process, whether it's the infrastructure, uh, you know, large expenditures on infrastructure, whether it's the large expenditure on healthcare uh, or rural healthcare, whether it's the mission mode on agriculture, and everything, everything has connections with technology, with the digital technology, with AI. So it's not that we are working in the old-fashioned way of how things used to happen here 10 years ago or 15 years ago. I think uh, we have uh, uh, we have found a new path. Uh, we have great leadership uh, uh, at the center, and I think uh, this new path is definitely generating a, a lot of enthusiasm, generating a lot of energy in all the Indians, uh, young and old. You look at our uh, startup ecosystem; it is just simply amazing. That's in your town, most of it in Bangalore. I mean, who would have thought uh, uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago that you would have so many unicorns coming out of technology startups in India? I mean, we, we thought we didn't know technology. So I think these are great examples of, uh, you know, how crisis leads to opportunity and uh, given a good regulatory framework, uh, given good governance uh, in the system by the government and by all the other stakeholders, uh, you can really you know, take advantage of this and uh, and create a much larger uh, economy. You can your own personal participation as an individual can be much larger than what it has been in the past. So these are just some of my thoughts on on the, your question of how to convert a crisis into an opportunity and how to you know, how does the innovation come in? Thank you, thank you, sir. I think. You have uh, very well captured, uh, starting with uh, the historical perspective, and then you uh, closed it on very interesting and very positive uh, thoughts about uh, the COVID's uh, plus uh, points. Uh, and you mentioned, uh, in a way, three mantras. One, um, uh, leadership focus, uh, which is, of course, driven by our PM. Second is that uh, the mission mode uh, is so that all the uh, key people are uh, as if we are fighting a war. And that war, uh, as you said, mission mode seems to be uh, given, uh, giving us uh, wonderful uh, uh, results. Uh, and the third one, third point, which I, uh, we learned from you today is that involvement of people and also how if you uh, increase the participation where every Indian uh, was uh, sort of uh, through various initiatives, including of course his uh, very favorite monkey bath. But uh, you are uh, saying that the involvement of people seems to have uh, also increased and uh, significantly. And that I think those three sort of mantras uh, what uh, what I, we could get from your uh, uh, reply. Thank you. Uh, linked with this, sir, uh, one more thing that uh, keeps uh, many uh, people, both the academic uh, side as well as uh, on the uh, industrial side, they are all uh, looking at, uh, you, you mentioned uh, some sectors, uh, uh, but what could be the priority sectors or critical sectors where innovation um, should be focused on? You did mention agriculture, you did mention uh, a few other, including of course, uh, healthcare. So healthcare, uh, defense, uh, aeronautics, and uh, agriculture, what else? And uh, that is the first part of the uh, my question. And second is, of course, uh, why? Uh, why these are critical? Because a few, um, a, a few years ago, healthcare, especially a primary healthcare, was not considered uh, such a priority. But I think pandemic uh, changed it all. And uh, India's response, because uh, I, I remember uh, the type of uh, 
doomsday scenarios that were being painted that with india's uh, uh, you know pathetic uh, primary health care uh, scenario uh, it will wipe out uh, millions and uh, millions of people but it did not happen and i think this is a puzzle uh, which uh, uh, academics especially in institutes like i am can work on and uh, write case studies as to what we did but since we are in the middle of it it is too early to write case studies but uh, if you could uh, respond as to what other than health health has come out as a very great priority area and uh, defense as you mentioned because of the pressures on our borders defense is a but uh, defense uh, we have been having all all these uh, decades some trouble or the other whether it is northern or north uh, western side of our borders so uh, in your thoughts sir what would you consider as uh, uh, say uh, priority sectors for the next 5 uh, years for uh, india you know uh, it's a very interesting question first of all i think we need to understand that uh, we are living in a age where uh speed of uh, development of new technologies and the velocity of developing new technologies and products from new technologies has never been greater than what it is today you know i mean by the time you think of something and try to do it it almost becomes obsolete so technology has been a a very big uh, uh let's say uh you know Uh, it's it's a it's a it's a major major issue today in terms of understanding what technology and what area you need to work with in terms of uh, new ideas and innovation and if you look at that uh, you look at any area uh, you cannot leave out uh, healthcare or agriculture or automotive or manufacturing or defense now everything is changing in terms of how the products are being made how they will be made in the future and therefore what technologies you need now the basics that i as i understand uh, you know unless and until you are completely digital in terms of your processes and your thinking and your application unless you understand how to use artificial intelligence you may not be a ai engineer but uh, you need to understand how how to bring that capability in your system and in your products and of course uh, <clears throat> you then need to understand how to reskill and uh, reposition the talent in your organization and this goes for an organization goes for a country or goes for anything else the biggest the biggest problem is going to be uh, this entire uh, we call it the vuca environment a very highly volatile uncertain uh, environment that is being created by the rapid changes in technology uh, and largely uh, you know the tech companies the big tech companies in the world largely in the united states of course in china and in japan uh, you know coming out with all kinds of new technologies and products uh, that are driven by uh, the digital world uh, and you know through the technology processes that we see today i mean take example uh, in the whole of last year when we were uh restricted to be at home uh, nothing stopped the best thing that happened in india was that uh, in 3 months india became digital uh if we had put a plan uh to make india digital that would have been a 5 to 7 year plan so we didn't need a plan and uh, you know everybody understood how to use digital technology how to use uh, your phone smartphones how to use zoom or teams or you know google slack whatever you wanted to use i mean you know nothing stopped everything was working i mean we were able to have meetings with uh, 500 people uh, using webex and very effectively so the big lesson that came out of this uh, was that uh, you know you are in a digital world uh, whether we like it or not and the good thing is india has adapted to the digital world very well so has the rest of the world as has adapted to this extremely well uh the second is uh you know where do you innovate now there is no sector that is going to remain as it is not a single sector 
Okay, so therefore you need innovation in every sector. I will start with agriculture. Agriculture will see the largest use of artificial intelligence and uh, digitalization than any other sector because this is such a large sector in India with so many people involved. So you're going to see some tremendous amount of work being done in this sector using technology. And okay, I don't know what the effects of that are going to be. I think I'll leave that to I am Bangalore to figure out, uh, but it is going to have some profound effects. And similarly, healthcare sector. In the old days, you needed to have doctors going to places and you needed uh, vehicles to take them and equipment to take them. I think in less than three, four years, you know, your phone is going to be, your smartphone is going to be able to do almost 70, 80% of the work the doctors would do. Right. And therefore, uh, uh, the reach of uh, healthcare through telemedicine or through other routes is going to be immense. And treating patients using AI-based uh, uh, you know, knowledge uh, is going to be a, a big field that is coming up. So this is just two examples. You take the automotive industry. It's clear that the world is moving to electric vehicles. So, you know, uh, the era of IC engine is going to die uh, very soon. And that is a very, very big uh, transformation for this very large manufacturing sector worldwide. You know, today, the automobile industry makes uh, 80 to 90 million IC engine vehicles a year. It's not a small amount. It's all over the world. And uh, they got millions of people who work uh, in machine in machine shops producing components. Uh, when you go to EVs, you know, there's no such components. <laughs> there are very, very few components. So big disruptions are going to happen with technology. And clearly, you need to be on top of these things if you want to survive. Otherwise, you won't survive. You take uh, the e-market explosion that is happening in India. Yes. Now, the e-market explosion wouldn't have happened if uh, the government would, would have not started the digital age back in 2017, 2018. You know, the entire digital payment systems, etc. I mean, it's an amazing thing that has happened to India in terms of changes. And now you have one of the largest uh, growth in uh, e-commerce in this country. I mean, anything that you want today is just a uh, phone call away, almost. You know, whether you want medicines, you want access to a doctor, you want vegetables, you want to buy something from Amazon or from Flipkart or XYZ. I mean, you know, it's all there. Uh, that has led to a completely different uh, innovation in terms of how logistics will take place. So one thing leads to another. And therefore, you know, uh, there is no, you can't make a list of what you will innovate and what you will not innovate. I think you need to understand that you need to absorb digital technology. You need to understand the use of AI. You need to understand the use of IoT if you're in manufacturing. And, you know, the biggest problem is going to be understanding what talent you need to bring. Because this is going to be the speed breaker that kind of comes in uh, in the innovation cycle. So this is one level of innovation. As a country, we are also looking at frontier technologies. So if you look at frontier technologies, quantum computing is a frontier technology. Okay, Hyper, hypersonic uh, uh, air, you know, travel is a frontier technology. Deep ocean uh, uh, systems are a frontier technology. So there is a lot of work that is going on in frontier technology, even on healthcare, understanding you know, uh, viruses in a different way, understanding what future pandemics may come, these are all frontier technologies. There's also a lot of work that's going on in understanding you know, issues of climate change since you talked of sustainability. Like the pandemic, which is uh, you know, something that affects the human body uh, very badly, like what we have seen with COVID-19. Question number 11. The, uh, the climate change issues can also impact the nation very badly. And we, you know, we need to be careful. The world needs to be careful on climate change. And I think that's one reason why uh, Prime Minister Modi has been a vocal participant of uh, uh, the Solar uh, Alliance. 
which was formed in Paris some years ago. And you can see that India's energy basket is shifting in a very large way now to renewables, in a big way. So there is all these changes taking place uh, which require innovation in every phase. You look at the fintech sector, uh, I mean, look at the innovations in the fintech sector. I think the innovations in India in the fintech sector are probably better than anywhere else in the world. Yes. So, you know, we are an open economy, we are, we are an open thinking, uh, uh, let's say, civilization here. Uh, we are also a civilization that embraces uh, everything. Uh, but I think uh, we also have enough uh, nationalistic pride in ourselves to say that we need to make India a lot better place than what it is. Great. <laughs> I think um, you have hit the um, nail on the head. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, VUCA environment. I think this VUCA environment has affected uh, all sectors uh, which affect human beings. So your point, I think, was that instead of looking at sectors and uh, looking at the technology or priority sectors, it is better to look at the root of this, which is uh, the digital world and which is affecting, of course, all the sectors, all uh, aspects of life of a, a common man. And I think that brings us to uh, the third point, which you mentioned, which is that better to focus on the frontier technologies. Uh, you mentioned a few, and I'm sure there are many more in that list, which uh, will make a significant impact across all the sectors that uh, I had listed uh, at the beginning. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the wonderful uh, um, answer because this is uh, something which was bothering many people uh, across sectors. Uh, the third uh, uh, point I wanted to also discuss with you is that Bharat Forge is very well known nationally and internationally. And uh, for one key aspect, that is that the innovation seems to have become a mantra or a DNA of your company. So if I may ask you as a, a national and a uh, international leader, what do you think needs to be done? What are those uh, mantras which will help other companies also to uh, build DNA, uh, build this innovation into their uh, uh, organizational DNA? Well, you know, I don't think we are the only ones that do uh, uh, innovative work or do research uh, to create innovation. There are many companies that do it, small and big. Yes. Uh, but yeah, you know, for us, uh, that has been uh, our uh, DNA for our organization, the DNA of the, you know, four or 5,000 people that work uh, in our company. And uh, uh, we have always uh, thought that uh, uh, whatever we need to do, we need to uh, innovate ourselves. We need to create the technology ourselves. We need to own the IP ourselves. And this really brings us to the bigger question of what is Atmanirbhar Bharat? Okay. Atmanirbhar Bharat, I think people, uh, many people have a different understanding of what uh, this means. You know, being Atmanirbhar fundamentally means that you need to own the technology, you need to have the IP. That doesn't mean that you don't need anybody from outside to come in uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, be in India. Uh, I'm not saying that. But in whatever sector that you are operating in, the old method of getting a TOT, technology transfer, since you're in HL, you would know that. Yes. Okay, the old method of getting TOT and producing something simply doesn't work in this age. Yes. Okay. So you need to be Atman Erba, you need to create your own IP. Now, how do you create your own IP? You can only create your own IP through some amount of research, whether it's application research, whether it's you know, basic research, or whatever it is. Now, how do you do that? You do that by working with research institutions. You can't do everything yourself. It's not possible. So we have, in India, we have large number of uh, 
research organization. If you look at the defense, you have DRDO. It's got some amazing uh, capabilities in research, amazing scientists and people uh, heading the DRDO. Uh, you look at the CSIR, tremendous amount of laboratories doing research in various different fields. I mean, amazing fields. I, you could, you know, we were able to see all this happening during the COVID time because this is what came together with all the silos broken and then all of a sudden they were able to make products which were required for treating uh, COVID patients. And then you have all the technical and other institutions in India, including yours, I am Bangalore. All of you are engaged in research. And, you know, industry is now uh, slowly getting together and breaking their silos and creating partnerships with uh, these research organizations. So this has now become almost a national level uh, activity. Many, many companies are, are creating uh, these partnerships. You, if you look at uh, uh, IIT uh, Madras, it has got some of the amazing incubation center uh, for technology that it has created. IIT Pawai has created a similar incubation center. I'm sure I am Bangalore has something uh, similar to that. You have Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, which does uh, you know, research in frontier technologies, uh, some of it that I talked about. So you got this uh, whole network and ecosystem uh, that has got recharged in India. It was always there, but somehow it was operating in silos, you know, and it didn't allow anybody else to enter those silos. Now those silos are all open and, you know, they are all accessible and they are accessible to any Indian uh, who wants to access it. So this is great. And I think this is what will really create the kind of uh, innovative, uh, uh, innovativeness, create the whole Atmanirbharta that is required in technology, in products. And this is what India needs. You know, the whole question of how do you make India Atmanirbhar, it's not just defense. You need to make India Atmanirbhar in agriculture, in health, healthcare, in, uh, you know, uh, toys, for example. All our toys are coming from China. There is a honorable prime minister is going to address uh, uh, a major uh, seminar or webinar on toy production. Right. So, hackathon. Yeah, a hackathon on toy, toy production. So, there are so many things that we need to do uh, uh, to get things moving in this country through innovation and through creating your own technology and your own IT. Great, sir. I think. Uh, uh, you have given us, uh, in a way, the, the mantras of uh, create your own IP, focus on your own IP. Of course, uh, many companies uh, feel it is impractical because uh, they need to invest a lot of money on it and uh, so on. But then you gave a second uh, uh, mantra that don't try to create everything yourself, try and get into partnerships with people, uh, with institutes. I think, I think that way also Bharat Forge has been a role model where you have linked up with many of the IITs and uh, so on. I just wanted to also tell you, sir, since you brought up that uh, NSR cell is one such uh, cell within, is an also a center of excellence uh, within IIM, which has been over the last uh, almost two and a half decades uh, has been incubating or helping to incubate uh, startups. And uh, we would like to think that Bangalore has become the startup hub of uh, India, uh, yes. primarily also because of uh, NSR cells uh, contribution in this uh, field. So uh, thank you, sir, for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, answer about uh, the focus of Atma Nirbhar and what, uh, what actually it means. Um, so it's not isolation, isolating yourself, but uh, com uh, developing uh, uh, or sharpening your saw and developing your uh, teeth, sharpening your teeth, very nice. Sir, uh, one point uh, being from India Japan Study Center, I have to ask you this uh, very important question. And uh, what are the possibilities of uh, India and Japan uh, working together 
in uh, these uh, frontier technologies and how uh, we can, um, the, the, we means both the policy makers as well as the industrialists as well as the academic uh, institutions could facilitate such working of uh, these two uh, uh, giants. You know, as the co-chair of the India-Japan Business Leaders Forum uh, yes. in 2018, uh, I had, uh, when we had our meeting, uh, in my talk, I had said that uh, the size of India and Japan's uh, relationship can grow as per the aspirations of both the nations and the people in both the nations, uh, rather than opportunity. So I think, uh, you know, uh, the, the aspirations, if they are big, uh, the activities and the relationship will get, uh, get bigger. Uh, it will be multiple higher than today because if you look at <coughs> what Japanese companies and Japanese organizations are doing in India, they probably touch the life of about some 200, 250 million people out of the 1.35 billion people that we have. So they are still a, a billion odd people, uh, you know, who have needs and requirements which are only going up, not going down. So this relationship can be very large uh, compared to what it is today. This is the first point I'd like to make. Uh, between the two governments, our prime minister has always said, and so has the Japanese prime minister at that time, that uh, we have a very very special and strategic uh, global partnership and a great winning combination between the two countries. And, uh, you know, whether it is working together to go into uh, other areas of uh, uh, the globe, like Africa, and, you know, Middle East, and other places, uh, whether it's working uh, towards uh, uh, finding solutions uh, uh, like the Quad is today for defense and uh, other purposes, uh, like increasing our trade, you know, it is, uh, it is a special relationship. And it's been so not only today, but I think more than, uh, I would say, 15 uh, odd years. Uh, the last point I'd like to say is the best example of Atmanirbhar Thai is Japan. You know, Japan built up its uh, economy and its industry after the war by being Atmanirbhar. Yes. So we have a lot to learn from them in terms of how to become entrepreneur. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. I think uh, that is a wonderful answer. Yes, uh, a lot to learn from them. And I think the uh, key point also you made was it is the aspiration, not the activity or what we have said. So focus on aspirations and uh, make those aspirations of the two countries meet, then the activities will be easier to uh, push uh, between them. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, the strategic partnership between these two countries is uh, already recognized and uh, is on. Now we have to only increase the, the speed of uh, uh, this happening. Sir, uh, you have been, as we mentioned in the beginning, you have been recognized as uh, both uh, governments uh, as a, a very key person who is uh, stimulating uh, these the relationship between these two countries. So uh, can, I, can we ask you a very um, sort of personal question? Uh, that is, uh, you have been associated with Japan in various capacities as a businessman, as a technocrat, as a leader, of course. So, uh, could we, uh, could we, uh, could you throw some light on what have you personally uh, learned in 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 uh, from uh, from uh, Japan uh, as a businessman, as a technocrat, as a leader uh, of uh, hundreds of people, thousands of people in India? Yeah, I will. You know. I first went to Japan in the mid 70s when I, I started working only from the early 70s. So I first went to Japan, I think it was 77, 78, something like that. And I was staying in the Imperial Hotel at that time. 
And, uh, you know, if you've got the right room in the Imperial Hotel, not looking over the garden, but looking on the other side, uh -huh. uh, there's a big road uh, uh, that is there uh, where there's a lot of traffic. And I used to see a lot of people walking up and down and walking at a speed which was just unbelievable. Nice. You could see, you know, you, you almost felt uh, that this is the reason why Japan is so good and, you know, so efficient and makes so many good products because these people work very hard uh, and that impressed me the most uh, in Japan. And of course, I have great respect uh, and regards for uh, J Japanese companies, the way they have uh, developed the technology that they have produced. But it's a lot to do with their people. Uh, you know, people's participation, the way that people work. Uh, and that has been extremely impressive uh, for me to learn personally. And that's the one reason why I was building my relationships with uh, many companies in Japan. I think, I, I think it's, it's a great opportunity for India that we have a, a country like Japan as a, as a strategic partner uh, in our relationship. And uh, I think there's a lot of commonalities uh, uh, between India and Japan. Uh, you know, first is uh, uh, ethnically, we are uh, almost similar Asians. Uh, uh, Buddhism is as common in India as in Japan. Yes. So uh, it's not a, <clears throat> a very, very different culture. Yeah, there are cultural differences, there's no doubt. But there is something, there's a lot that India can learn uh, from Japan. A lot that uh, we can learn even on a people-to-people -people, uh, participation. A lot we can learn on, uh, you know, culture-to-culture -culture participation. Uh, it's not, everything doesn't happen only by companies investing into the economy. Of course, that's important. There is no doubt. Trade is important. But uh, more important than that is a people-to-people -people relationship. Right. Right. Thank you. I think this particular input is very important for IJSC because uh, our focus also, we will calibrate accordingly uh, based on whatever you advised just now, that increase the cultural interaction, the people-to-people -people interaction, and um, both of us being Asian uh, sort of Eastern culture, we believe uh, that a good personal relationship or personal bond leads to um, uh, the development of trust and uh, the longer uh, term relationships are cemented rather than just uh, as a uh, give and uh, take. In fact, I have worked with a, a, a important person called Shoji Shiba. He, I'm sure you have also heard of him. He was one of the, uh, worked with, uh, for Indian manufacturing. He has done quite a bit of work by uh, driving this VLFM program, Visionary Leaders for uh, Manufacturing. So he used to talk about a very interesting point that noble mindset, we used to initially wonder what is this noble mindset he's talking about, especially to hardcore uh, business people. But I think what uh, he later on used to explain is that I think that uh, focus is also a very important uh, input of give and uh, give rather than the give and the take, which is typical Western style. And, um, and he used to also quote the Bhagavad Gita, Karmanye Vathikarasye, Na Phaleshu Kadachana. So where we are looking at doing your karma rather than looking at what the results are, I think you have touched upon a very important uh, input, which is very significant for us. Thank you. And uh, sir, uh, taking this uh, India-Japan uh, relationship, we are now on the third theme, which is very important uh, to learn because we have learned a lot from the Japanese uh, learning and still continue to learn. But there is one aspect which puzzles all of us. They are so disciplined, they are so um, uh, focused and uh, they are quite uh, strategic in their approach to everything. But uh, in fact, their economy, as uh, you, you very well know, has stagnated. In fact, uh, many of the academics uh, use uh, 
uh, economic uh, economists and academics use the term japanization and uh, to basically mean that uh, uh, the economy has actually gone into long term uh, stagnation and a sort of deflation so uh, typical symptoms of uh, this uh, which japan and Jap japanese society uh, has been facing over the years is a high degree of uh, uh, unemployment or uh, quality of employment not being what it should be weak economic activities interest rates uh, being uh, zero zero or sub zero quantitative easing Uh, which is also we have seen many such spurts of by the policy makers and of course uh, uh, the mo mo most critical is the population which is aging so uh, considering this um, we uh, uh, i have a question for you in the sense that in in the global uh, context uh, what can uh, the government uh, or governments do to mitigate uh, this downward uh, trends which uh, japan has uh, in fact uh, experienced for decades and um, linked with that the second uh, point was uh, what could be the policy lessons for india to avoid uh, such a situation in the future we would like to know your thoughts on this sir First of all, I, I have to confess to you that I'm not an economist, so <laughs> it's very difficult for me to uh, uh, comment on uh, uh, complex economic issues as the stagflation that you see in Japan, uh, or let's say like uh, I mean stagnant growth for many many years uh, in Japan. Uh, but in spite of that, the Japanese society seems to be doing quite well. Of course, everybody can do better. There's no doubt, uh, but they seem to be doing quite well. Uh, so I won't comment on that because uh, I'm really not uh, equipped to comment on. And as I said, I'm not an economist. But your second question, uh, in terms of India, I don't think we need to worry about uh, that in India. You know, India has only one way to go from here, and that is up. And that's not just for a short period of time, but for a very long period of time. So uh, we really don't need to worry about that uh, for India. We need to worry more about how do we increase uh, the horsepower to drive our economy faster uh, and bigger. And I think that horsepower is going to come from all the policies uh, uh, that the government has announced, including now the disinvestment policy. That's going to be a big drive uh, to make all the public sector companies private. and uh, bring in private entrepreneurship uh, to drive these organizations and uh, you know that's all these things whether it's atmanirbhar bharat this uh, you know uh, let's say indigenizing all the defense equipment etc and making those kind of things whether it's uh, making agriculture uh, smarter using uh, digital technology etc you know all this is going to uh, uh, make india a very different place in terms of economic activity even in the next 5 to 7 years so we have only one direction to look at and that direction is how do we grow i think there is the first target that our honorable prime minister has set for us which is a 5 trillion dollar economy target and i think uh, by that time hopefully in the next 5 uh, 7 years we will become the third largest economy and then we have to figure out how do we you know Uh, move from there upwards <clears throat> and by doing that it's important that uh, we don't lose the uh, sight of making this an inclusive process making this uh, where everybody gains in the process and i think uh, that's also pretty much on the agenda of the government the way it is moving ahead in terms of its policies and governance so that you know everybody it prospers in the prosperity of the nation so this is how i would look at it right right great thank you i think the key point is that uh, involvement of uh, private uh, uh, investments and uh, which will really give the push uh, generate the 
push for us to uh, do this. And uh, India is, is uh, very happy to learn that we have uh, some more years uh, to worry about this in case it happens. But uh, sir, linked with this, um, do we have any role models? Do you think India should have a role model um, uh, as a country I'm talking about, other than China? China, of course, we know uh, what they, they are capable of or they are, what they have achieved. But um, other than China, can India or Japan or India and Japan or India alone could learn from any other country as to how uh, to manage or is it that we need to discover our own way forward? I think the best role model in my opinion is Japan. As I said earlier, Japan, you know, uh, after the second war, Japan really became Atma Nirva. You know, uh, whether it was their government's policies or the way their industries worked, they became Atma Nirva. And that's exactly what we need to do. We need to create uh, large conglomerates in this country uh, who can uh, drive the economy with a lot more horsepower, uh, with uh, very large scale uh, of operations and large scale of production. We need scale and size. And with scale and size, uh, you know, you will create your own business model in terms of how the nation will move forward. I mean, take the example of our uh, e-commerce uh, startups. Yes. You know, I mean, it's just incredible how quickly and how fast these have come. Now, this would, this would never happen if it was not uh, uh, private sector managed and private sector funded. Yes. Okay. I mean, government's job is to show the roadmap, which is what they did. They created the startup ecosystem, they showed the roadmap, and then allowed entrepreneurs to take advantage of that roadmap and create a new business model in e-commerce. And I think we are doing pretty well in that area, I would say. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Same thing is happening in uh, you know, FinTech uh, and other uh, you know, financial uh, kind of uh, institutions that are coming up. Right. So there is a lot of opportunity uh, for India, but uh, I think the role model for us in terms of uh, creating our own capabilities, we have to look at Japan. Right, right. Thank you. I think that is a, a wonderful uh, way forward for us. And uh, that means we have to speed up our learning process with uh, Japan. We already have good partnership links with them. And um, I think if we, um, as a receiver of this learning, we have to be more proactive probably uh, than the given. And uh, sir, uh, with this Make in India, the Atmanirbhar, uh, we are looking at uh, building of uh, local skills. Uh, it could be technology uh, or it could be even conversion skills new technology or indigenization of technology or creating new technology. And uh, the question which is asked many times, will it make the rich become richer, the poor become poorer, or will all this help to bridge this economic uh, disparity that we are seeing that uh, our wealth is concentrated in a very limited number of hands. So will it promote uh, what Prime Minister has been talking about on and off about Sabka Saath and uh, Sabka Vikas? Will that inclusive growth happen? I personally think yes. I think uh, for a nation it's first important to create wealth and then distribute wealth. <coughs> because if you don't create any wealth then there's nothing to distribute. You're right. So I think uh, it will happen. I think we are moving in that direction. Yes, uh, there will be always some instances where uh, people, depending on the risk and reward position that they take, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, they position themselves. Uh, some will be get, some will be rewarded more. Some will be rewarded less. But that's life. <laughs> Sir, uh, one uh, the last part of the discussion I wanted to bring in, if it is okay with you, if you are tired, we can... Uh... No, I'm not tired, but I have another uh, video meeting in uh, 25 minutes. 
95 for another location so <laughs> <laughs> we will keep it short uh, just one quick point sir and this is also uh, something which uh, comes up both uh, in the academic circles as well as the uh, practical aspects that globalization has created or uh, increased the overall uh, gdp of the world from um, about 90 trillion in 2010 to almost 150 trillion um, in 2021 projected to be maybe delayed by a year or so because of pandemic but uh, this uh, type of uh, impact would not have happened but for globalization and uh, we all know uh, that uh, as you also have been mentioning in many forums including in the early part of this forum that uh, uh, many countries are deglobalizing they are uh, closing their borders and uh, global trade has in fact reduced over the past uh, few years but uh, and many votaries of globalization uh, economists academics and industrialists are urging leaders to of the governments to stay committed to this cause of globalization and resist uh, the de demands for uh, productionism. Um, considering that uh, your company also has uh, become an international player uh, because of uh, the globalization. And um, finally, of course, COVID also has taught us that though we had closed all the borders, but uh, sharing of uh, information, sharing of, uh, in, in times of crisis, uh, sharing of uh, uh, data, sharing of uh, technologies maybe, would uh, benefit uh, everybody. So uh, the, the, the considering these, uh, some people think that uh, indigenization, that means closing of yourself from the world, is uh, in a way retrograde uh, as it uh, stifles uh, uh, seamless flow of products uh, based on economic principles only, not uh, necessarily Atma uh, Nirbharta. But uh, if somebody is very good at making umbrellas, he should continue to make umbrellas rather than you uh, doing it uh, again, because that creates uh, inefficient uh, sort of, uh, you can call it silos. So the final question, sir, for today from me, uh, there are a few from the audience, quite a few from the audience, but we'll select one or two for you to answer. But uh, you are a great votary of indigenization in many sectors, such as defense, uh, aeronautics. So what is your take on these ideas which I mentioned, uh, or concerns which I mentioned about indigenization versus uh, globalization you know the way we understood globalization uh, uh, 15 20 years ago i think uh, uh, that concept has completely changed uh, during the last four years uh, uh, starting with the united states and then you know other countries uh, and europe now the brexit is is happening so that concept has completely changed okay uh, i think uh, Everybody is putting uh, their own citizens as first, their own country as first. That doesn't mean that uh, you don't trade with other countries. That doesn't mean that uh, you don't uh, buy products from other countries. I think uh, it's just that uh, you, know, you have different products to make. So that's the point number one. Second point is, the old concept of, uh, you know, you made umbrellas, therefore you continue making umbrellas, that's just not on anymore because you have a huge amount of technology disruptions taking place. You know, the umbrella will be replaced by something else technologically. So you can't continue making umbrellas if something else comes. And therefore, it's important that you need to be uh, globalized in a flat world to the extent of technology and uh, understanding technology, and I think that is already happening with uh, the digital world that we live in. You know, you, I mean, for example, everybody uses Netflix or uh, something like that in their homes to see, uh, uh, you know, to have entertainment, see movies or something like, you know, those kind of things. 
So instead of buying a product, you are now buying a service right. which comes from some other place. Right. So you know, so therefore, there is a big change uh, in in the way trade is going to be conducted. Maybe countries like India will become countries that make a lot of products. If we become capable in making those products, right. and uh, the more technologically advanced countries will be capable of providing services that are required, uh, uh, you know, to drive uh, a society. So that's the kind of change that at least I see uh, kind of going forward. Right. Uh, that doesn't mean that India will not provide services. I'm not saying that. But I think uh, that's the way uh, I see things. You know, like we use Zoom, we use Teams, uh, we, we see Netflix, uh, we see Hotstar, I mean, we see all these kind of services, streaming services, uh, which are not Indian. Of course, Indian services will, will come. There's no doubt. I mean, there's so many guys making apps nowadays. So it will come. But, you know, the size and scale of uh, the service business is not easy to duplicate uh, in a short period of time. Right, right. I think uh, you have touched upon a very important uh, point that the old lens of looking at uh, globalization versus indigenization, those lenses you have to remove and look at it vis-a-vis -vis the speed of technological change and try to keep yourself uh, on the cutting edge of uh, those changes. I think wonderful. Sir, uh, there is a spate of questions uh, from the uh, viewers. I will select uh, maybe one, two or three, maybe. Um, one important uh, question, sir, is uh, that the GOI, Government of India, has uh, given a lot of uh, initiatives to promote uh, uh, private players in uh, sectors like defense and aeronautics, which um, you are fully aware. And in fact, it has come about probably, uh, not probably, it is because of your initiative in these uh, policy bodies that you have done this. So uh, my question to you, sir, is uh, do you feel that the, these policy changes are <laughs> successful so far? If not, what else could be done? I think the policy changes are very good. Uh, uh, you know, the success of the policy changes will depend on what happens in the next few years because of these policy changes. So it's been, uh, you know, I think the jury is not out on that as yet, but I believe uh, they will be successful. I think there is tremendous intent of all stakeholders, uh, whether it's the government, whether it's the Ministry of Defense, whether it's the services, and whether it's the uh, private enterprises, the public enterprises, all the stakeholders, uh, believe uh, in this policy. And this policy has a lot of room for uh, newcomers to get into, uh, into this field. There's whole host of uh, 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 you know, policy measures like the uh, IDEX and like uh, you know, funding of uh, innovation and you know, innovative ideas for small uh, and medium scale entrepreneurs uh, to get into the defense space. So there is a whole host of things that are there in the policy and they're working pretty well as of now. So I think uh, I'm very uh, satisfied with what is happening. And I, I really believe that this will create a sea change in the way the defense uh, industry will come out uh, in the next two, three, four years from this. Great, sir. I think we are all looking at uh, BFL uh, to because you are already there in terms of uh, the uh, products or designs and uh, investments that uh, you have done uh, in a very uh, sort of visionary way that you have done it. There are uh, two very interesting questions, sir. Something which uh, also puzzles us, uh, many Indians, that though the relationship between India and Japan, as you said, there is strategic relationship, but uh, the uh, trade between these two countries is a very, very uh, insignificant in terms of uh, volume. Uh, what do you think? Uh, of course, this is a very deep question, uh, but uh, would you like to give a quick answer on this, sir? Yeah, sure. Uh, I have given answers to this question many times, uh, so I have no problem in answering this. You know, as I said earlier, uh, 
the relationship between india and japan is very strategic at a political level uh, at a government to government level but uh, at uh, when you look at uh, you know the industry the, the organizations in japan the organizations in india the relationship is not aspirational right. and you know we need to change this relationship to a aspirational relationship maybe there are things that we need to do uh, in india there are things that uh, the japanese system needs to do in japan but if you make this aspirational then uh, you will see a big jump in uh, the trade numbers uh, that that you have in front of you today this has always been an issue in many of our deliberations between uh, india japan business leaders forum etc uh and largely uh, you know we need to convert this to a aspirational relationship great sir one final question um it says that uh, this is of course uh, a concern which the um, society as in general has it but also the people at the bottom of the pyramid that uh, so much is happening growth is happening innovations are happening but our lives are not changing or at least in the short term it is not having any impact what would be your response to uh, this type of concern that keeps coming up now and then you know uh, unfortunately we have just been through a, uh, a major pandemic and i think this pandemic uh, has kind of uh, upset the lives and livelihood uh, of many people uh, and you know it's a fact that the indian economy is going to contract uh, in this financial year it's not going to expand in this financial year hopefully in the next financial year it will expand in a much larger way and this is a pain that we are all bearing uh, nobody is uh, spared from this pain uh, unless you are in a in a business or industry that uh, kind of uh, uh, benefited from the pandemic uh, you know most of us are not uh, in that business so uh, my own view is that uh, you know as time passes as we move into uh, the next fiscal uh, we will start seeing growth and a much higher level of growth and i think that will to a large extent uh, solve uh, this issue uh, at the lower end of the pyramid i'll give you two examples uh, uh, in terms of my own personal experience we do a lot of work in uh, as part of our csr activity in village development we have taken 100 villages in maharashtra uh, for development and in in at least 50% of these villages we are beginning to see reverse migration taking place that means people who left the villages because there no no economic activity are coming back because their their income levels are suddenly shot up uh, because of the development work that is happening or whatever else that is happening so i think uh i see at least a road map that is there uh, uh available and that road map is largely improved infrastructure availability of water uh, healthcare uh, you know schooling and that's what the government is focusing on to a large extent today so i think plus the direct transfer scheme uh, that uh, honorable prime minister put in some years ago we seem to be working well uh, at least uh with the rural community and uh, the people at the bottom of the pyramid so i i would see a lot of optimism uh coming forward right right i think we lost yes, the connection uh yes sir i think you can hear us sir hello Hello, sir. You can hear us. Yeah, I can. Uh, I think we lost our connection for some reason. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, sir, for your uh, very hopeful, uh, insightful, and incisive uh, message that you have sent to us. And uh, the hopeful is very important because um, you have stressed on the fact that uh, the worst. Uh, is probably over uh, in terms of uh, whatever we have gone through the suffering 
But more important also is that in all these areas that you talked about, uh, including India and Japan relationship, the message that you have left is that strategic relationship uh, and the aspirational uh, link uh, to- I'm not able to hear you uh, at all. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, what happened? Can we can hear you now. You can hear me, sir? Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, I just was saying, sir, is that you have uh, given a very um, hopeful uh, message, uh, full, a message full of hope for uh, uh, starting from the uh, bottom of the pyramid right up through the entrepreneurs. Oh, I, I'm not able to hear you. Sorry. I think the connectivity is very bad. Sir, uh, is it any better? I think it's a connectivity problem. I would, uh, you know, I would like to just thank you for this opportunity, Mr. Ratna. And uh, we'd like to say goodbye to you now because I have to go for another call. I thank you for this opportunity. And thank you to all the uh, organizers and listeners on this uh, program. Thank you very much. Namaste. Jai Hind. Thank you. Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Anyway, whatever it is. It's, it's finished, no? We are not connected. <laughs>